Well, I can start it to the time when I first heard Joan's voice. I remember hearing her on the radio when she just had hit it. it must have been 59. And then just, you know, ooing and eyeing and saying, oh, that's the way to sing and everything. I was, I was really bowled over by the quality of sound and the, the drive that she had, the energy when, when she sings. Marilyn and I sort of hit it off the, the, when, we, when we very first met. We seemed to have the same um, possibly zany outlook on certain things. It's there somehow between the two of us. It's not something that we have to work for. The timbre of, of each voice seems to, to match the other very well, so that when they sing together, you don't get a lot of, of, of horrible vibrations, which do occur when certain people sing together. They're both good musicians, they're both sensitive musicians, and I think they both like each other, basically, and yet each one inspires the other to sing a little bit better. I think there's a certain rivalry, a certain good sort of rivalry. Each of us receives something from the other, and, and it, it um, urges us to, to sing that much, much better, I think. That's probably one of the reasons why Joan and I have um, had this wonderful collaboration in our singing is because we're both trying for the same things. Uh, anybody in the winds? The three before 182. Um, they should, they don't play a dot them. Da -de -da -da. Have a break, everybody. Where do you want to begin that? You know, when, when you have a concert like this, it's much harder to rehearse uh, 16 different numbers, or whatever it amounts to be, than to rehearse a whole opera. Oh, from, from Dick or Dick? I see, yeah. yeah. That's 11.40. By sitting down together like that, it means that we have decided what the program's going to be, exactly what the cuts are going to be, um, what parts we need to get. Richard, is there some place before the Acqua del Giorno that might make logical sense? I suppose my function is to try and make it as easy as it is possible for the two ladies so that they can sit back and enjoy themselves and sing well. Uh, who, who timed that? Now, if it's a real problem to cut this, then the alternative is to make it a three. Is anyone having both ladies consider staying on stage? Well, that's, that's nerve-wracking for yeah. them in a way, isn't it? Because, you know, if, if they can relate to one another, relate to the audience and sing really with their hearts, then they'll give a great show because they are two of the greatest singers of the 20th century. And to put them together, not it doesn't double the impact. I think it, it four times, five times the impact. And it's, it's very exciting to hear them singing together. I really don't remember a thing about it. And, of course, there was the fantastic night of the first night of Lucia and the um, Zeffirelli production. I think it, it possibly was the most beautiful thing I had seen at Covent Garden, and yet I was in it myself. And um, I never really expected to, that it would have the results that it did. I don't really remember the exact time we met. He won a scholarship and uh, went to London, and um, a year later I followed. And on the first day I was there, just about killed me walking around from one museum to another. He couldn't wait to show me everything in one day. I, I sort of finally had to hold up my hands and say, listen, I, I mean, I hope I'm going to be here for a while. Please don't, don't show me everything in one day. And he said, oh, there's plenty more to see. <laughs> and I found out he was right. Well, I think that, that every singer needs to have someone to keep a very watchful eye on them. None of us really hear ourselves as other people hear us. And I think to have someone guarding and guiding my career has been absolutely fantastic. 
and, and a singer needs somebody to listen to them, to, to help them, to, to point out the mistakes that they're making, because even the greatest singers constantly fall into bad habits. All of them, there's no exception. I don't think there ever has been an exception. Can we do something else? Isn't it a bit boring? She had always a very solid middle voice, but she had also the top notes. But she used to sing without knowing. She hadn't the faintest idea whether she was singing a high F or a high C or what she was singing because she doesn't have the gift of perfect pitch. But to, to make her produce those notes consciously was, was a very hard job because she had a mental block about it. My job was just to make her see this, make her realise what she was missing, what she was able to do. It was merely a matter of giving confidence, a psychological job rather than, than anything else. I do tend to play a lot of ladies who are psychologically disturbed, become insane, either kill themselves, drown themselves, die of some sort of nervous attack, poison perhaps, a gentle stabbing. It's really great fun to play, uh, play the characters that don't die. It's, it's wonderful to do something like The Merry Widow, something like, like Fledermas. For Itani, again, it's fantastic for the, for the story to evolve through all the madnesses and uh, mistaken situations and come out on top of it actually still, still being alive. I, I don't think that either of us, when we first met, ever ever thought that we'd we'd marry and spend uh, 25 years together. <laughs> but um, that's the way it worked out. How much of it are we doing? I think we've had really more than than anybody can expect out of life and and a career, um, and it's been a very wonderful experience, I think, for both of us.